Okay, um, well, on, on behalf of the, the Baker Institute for Public Policy, and, and especially the uh, Tax and Expenditure Policy Program uh, within that institute, I would uh, very much like to welcome you to this forum on the uh, current economic situation uh, in the U.S., a forum that's going to focus on the state of manufacturing and also on federal, state, and local fiscal imbalances. Um, as all of you know, the fiscal problems at, at all levels of government facing the U.S. have drawn a tremendous amount of attention in recent years, with lots of people arguing that the U.S. is currently on a, a fiscally unsustainable uh, course. And special attention has been paid to the manufacturing sector, which has, has been declining in relative importance in the U.S. for many years, but has also been experience, experiencing at least somewhat of a resurgence in certain sectors uh, due to the not entirely welcome uh, decline in energy prices. Uh, that has a, a, accompanied the explosion of production uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, and today we're, we're very fortunate uh, indeed to have two of the nation's foremost experts on these issues to share their insights uh, on these topics. So we're going to begin uh, with Chad Moutre, who is the chief economist for the National Association of Manufacturers. Chad earned his Ph.D. in economics from the Southern uh, Illinois University uh, and has been the dean of the School of Business Administration at Robert Morris College in Chicago. Uh, the Chief Economist and Director of Economic Research at the Small Business Administration. Uh, he has also served as the President and Chairman of the National Economist Club and as a board member of the National Association of Business Economists. I'm sure that many of you have seen him offering his insights on a wide variety of economic issues on CNN, Fox, Fox News, Fox Business, uh, Bloomberg, uh, Reuters, and many other uh, well-known media outlets. Uh, we're delighted to have him here to give us his latest uh, manufacturing economic update. And our uh, second speaker uh, is my uh, colleague and frequent collaborator, uh, John Diamond. Uh, he has uh, earned his BA in economics uh, from a school that a few of you may be familiar with, uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, and uh, he earned his PhD uh, in economics uh, from Rice, uh, where his supervisor was some guy named George Zodro. <laughs> But uh, he, he also, after, after that, worked for uh, four years at the Joint, uh, Economic Co uh, Joint Committee on Taxation. And we were very fortunate to bring him back uh, here to the Baker Institute, where he is the Kelly Fellow in Public Finance and also an adjunct professor in the Economics Department. He is one of the Baker Institute's most productive scholars, focusing on issues related to federal tax and expenditure policy, state and local public finance, including some very interesting work on uh, pensions, uh, and uh, also the construction and simulation of a computable general equilibrium models. And John's going to speak to us uh, on U.S. fiscal policy challenges. So without any further ado, Chad. So thanks, uh, thanks, George. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about the economy. This is an exciting day and that everyone is talking about the Fed and what it will do. So I'm sure that will come up not just in my remarks but also in the Q&A. And uh, regarding George's comment about the Renaissance, uh, certainly I can talk about that probably more likely in the Q&A than I would in, in this presentation. I want to really focus in my 15 minutes here on what I'm seeing in the economy and, and in particular uh, kind of foreshadowing uh, the conversation from this afternoon in terms of what the Fed will do or not do. So with that, uh, I'm going to start with this chart. This is, this is uh, where I like to start many of my presentations. It's the ISM's uh, Purchasing Managers Index. Uh, it's, I like to show it because, number one, it kind of summarizes really what we've seen in the, in the manufacturing sector so far over the last year. Uh, it's a nice sentiment survey, and, and it really more or less highlights some of the challenges that we currently are under. Uh, so for those of you who are, are not used to looking at this chart, numbers over 50 are expansion, numbers under 50 are contraction. Uh, and the good news here is that the, the, the overall uh, headline number, uh, which is the Purchasing Managers Index, uh, has not gone below 50. So we're not contracting right now, uh, but we're also not growing as fast as we would like. So let's, let's flash back to this time last year. And so you notice uh, that the two numbers I'm going to look at here, new orders and, and, and production, so that's the dark blue and the orange line, uh, were not just over 50, but they were over 60 at this point last year. Uh, and, and in fact, manufacturers at, in the second half of 2014 were very optimistic about their own company's overall production. Uh, they kind of had recovered from a very soft beginning of last year, if you remember. Uh, and, and, and in general, there was a lot of optimism and a, a, a sense that maybe finally we were getting some traction in the economy. We've had this kind of uh, dance for quite a number of years now where we think maybe we're getting some traction in the economy and then it doesn't happen, so a little bit of a deja vu feeling. But this is clearly where we were around, especially around November and December maybe of last year. Uh, 
And, uh, and, and even that was that optimism carried through to GDP. There was an expectation coming into this year that we were going to have 3% GDP, for instance, for the first time in 10 years. Uh, and as you can see by this chart, that didn't happen. So uh, what, what we have tended to see really since November is a deceleration in attitudes. For overall production is a lot lower than we would have hoped. Uh, and, and you see almost all of these numbers have decelerated. So, so what are some of the challenges that really have, have led to this kind of weaker than expected recovery so far this year? Well, the first one, is, and I'm not, I'll start with this just because I'm in Houston, right? So I'll start with crude oil. So crude oil prices, uh, obviously down 60% from where they were uh, last year. June, uh, June of 2014. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a whole number of spillover effects from that. Certainly here in Houston, you understand this perhaps more than even other folks throughout the country. Uh, but we clearly have seen a, a, a pullback on the energy sector, but that's had huge ramifications for the manufacturing sector writ large in that a lot of folks supply the energy sector. And, and as I was telling, telling George right beforehand, uh, you know, when you think about the recovery that we've had in the manufacturing sector really since the Great Recession, a lot of that had to do with energy. And so I think there's a surprise, I think, amongst a lot of folks that so many people supply to the energy sector, and that's really what's led to some, some at least some of, some of the declines that we've seen in sectors like the metal sector, a lot of machinery, a lot of places that we're really selling into to energy production. The other big headwind that I would say out there is the dollar. Uh, the dollar is up 21.5% since, since this time last year. Uh, I'll show you a, a chart. Actually, I don't have the chart in here, but the 21.5%, that's a pretty a tremendous gain that we've seen in the dollar in a very short period of time. Certainly, there's a lot of reasons behind that. We can get into why that's the case. But that stronger dollar means it's much tougher for a manufacturer in the U.S. to sell into Europe or into Canada or into you know a lot of other places around the world. Uh, and then you combine that with the fact that we've had really sluggish growth growth around the world as well. Uh, to Canada, our largest trading partner, which like Texas, is really suffering from lower crude oil prices right now. Uh, China, you, you know, you certainly heard an awful lot about China here in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, while Europe, of course, is doing a little better, they're growing 1%. They're our largest market outside of North America. So there's just been a number of challenges that we have experienced on the global side, so much so that manufacturing goods exports this year are down between four and a half, uh, roughly four to five percent. So it shows you that huge drag that the dollar and, and global markets have had on the overall U.S. output. The other kind of kind of side things that I'll kind of mention here, earlier this year uh, there was the West Coast ports slowdown, which had a very major impact for, for manufacturers really across the country. Uh, and it was really only more recently that we started to, to start to see the end of the tunnel there. Uh, and and the, the last kind of, now that I've depressed you enough here, the, the, last, the last headwind uh, just to say is there still is this tentativeness on the part of consumers and businesses, that deja vu feeling a little bit, that you see some tentativeness that continues to crop up every once in a while, including a couple, a couple days ago with retail sales numbers. So we continue to get uh, some surprising, even though uh, consumer spending is overall a bright spot, we, there still is a tentativeness there that you continue to see from time to time. So, so what do those headwinds mean for manufacturing production? So this is the month, month, monthly changes in manufacturing production. I didn't put the numbers up here because that would just overwhelm you if I had that many numbers on a chart. Uh, but you see here the kind of the, the takeaway is over the last four months, manufacturing production has been down in three of the last four months. And a lot of that volatility that we've seen in the last month, you know, huge spike in Ju July and a huge fall uh, in August, a lot of that was the auto sector. And you, you often see a little bit of a shift uh, in the summer months in autos that kind of uh, changes that a little bit. In general, what we've seen on a year-over-year -year basis is we began the year, uh, manufacturing production was up. Uh, kind of, again, year over year, so over the last 12 months, 4.5% in January, that's fallen to 1.5% uh, in, in the August data. So we, clearly we've seen a deceleration in, uh, in terms of overall manufacturing output over, again, just so far year to date. Uh, so what does that mean for, for GDP? Well, as I said earlier, uh, there was this expectation that we were going to have 3% GDP this year. That isn't going to happen. And I know that uh, we'll have a kind of a conversation about secular stagnation, I think, in, with the next speaker. But essentially, we're going to end up with 2.2% uh, growth is what I'm calling for, which essentially is the low twos, which is where we've been pretty much every year since the recession. It's kind of in those low, that low two range. Uh, the forecast for next year is 2.5%. Is 
Just to kind of discuss a little bit of, of the last couple quarters, certainly from the fourth quarter on, uh, exports were a huge, significant drag in both the fourth quarter of last year and the first quarter of this year, subtracting out you know roughly one and a half percentage points from that total. Um, so that shows you the extent to which overall in the economy, not, to, not just for manufacturing, that those dollar headwinds, those global headwinds really hit the U.S. in, in a very significant way. The other thing, of course, in the first quarter is both consumers and businesses pull back very strongly. Part of that was the energy sector, but it was bigger than that. Uh, and while you saw a little bit of a rebound in the second quarter on both the consumer and the business side, you still are seeing some tentativeness there, particularly for equipment spending, which I think is pretty notable. Um, with that said, uh, you see you know, roughly 2.5% range growth uh, over the coming quarters. I have 2.6% for the quarter that we are ending. Uh, I've seen forecasts that show it around two, so perhaps I'm on the high side there, uh, but I'm going to stick to that number. And hopefully that's right. Um, so this, we do a survey that comes out once a quarter. We've been doing it since 1997. Uh, and so here the, the, here's the good news. I'll give you the good news first, and then I'll give you a little bit more of a spin here. Uh, the first one is that two-thirds of our members are positive. So either uh, they're either somewhat or very positive about their own company's outlook. So that's nothing to sneeze at, two-thirds. It's normally that would be a good talking point, uh, except for the fact that in December, uh, as you can see, it was 91.2%. 91.2% of our members were positive. So we've seen a very steep decline in sentiment really just in the last nine months. And again, a lot of those headwinds were behind it. Now, one little caveat that I'll add to this survey, and I was kind of discussing it with John earlier, is we, 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 do, we conduct this survey the same time every single year. Uh, this particular survey was conducted the last two weeks of August. So as you know, the last two weeks of August were not the prettiest time in the global markets. You know, the stock market corrected by 10%. The Chinese stock market was down roughly 38%. People were not overly happy around that time about the economy. And you see that coming up in a lot of indicators, not just with consumer confidence, but also with this survey. Uh, my suspicion is it still would have been less than 76%, but whether it would have been 67, I don't know. So uh, you still are getting a sense that, that these headwinds have had an impact. And you see that also kind of playing itself out when you look at expectations for growth over the next 12 months. Uh, in December, we were looking at sales growth of roughly 4.5%, and now it's 2. Uh, production growth is also expected to grow around 2% over the next 12 months. Again, that's positive. It's not negative. I'm not talking about a recession. I'm not talking about shrinking in the manufacturing sector. What I'm talking about is that clearly we've seen the growth rate for manufacturing slow in a very material way in a very short period of time because of the headwinds uh, that, that we've seen uh, so far this year. And now we get to the timely question. Uh, again, keep in mind when this question was asked, this was the last two weeks of August, people were seeing their stock market fall. Uh, and so we, we, we asked, you know, what do you think the Fed's going to do? Uh, and, and to my surprise, uh, 64, I don't know if you can see that very well, 64.2% of our members were saying, hey, there's enough challenges out there in the economy right now, maybe you should wait before you raise short-term rates. Um, converse that with the 23.5% who said the opposite, which is, hey, interest rates have been zero since Lehman Brothers. I think it's time that we can start taking our foot uh, off the accelerator a little bit. Um, my own personal view is that the Fed was going to raise rates today, uh, up until August, uh, and now they won't. Uh, they'll raise them in December. But they could surprise me, and they could surprise all of us, uh, which they occasionally like to do. Uh, and and you know, the other comment to make is that we all jump over and kind of ignore the October meeting as if it doesn't happen. But there is a, an FOMC meeting, a Federal Open Market Committee meeting, in October. There just isn't a press conference there, and people just assume that if you're going to raise rates, uh, you're going to start, um, you're going to do it with a press conference afterwards. But they could surprise us in October as well. My sense is that they won't raise it today. They'll raise it either in October or December, most likely in December. The Fed is, is pretty eager to want to start the process of raising rates this year. And so I think that December pretty much is, is kind of the conventional wisdom thought there. Uh, and I think what this, uh, this particular survey is kind of showing out is that manufacturers are nervous about the headwinds enough to say, let's just wait till we get a little bit better data, and hopefully you'll have that by December. 
Um, just a quick trip around the world because I don't want to go through this. I could spend an entire day talking about the rest of the world. Uh, but we, you know, we, we've kind of, you know, when you look at the top 10 markets for U.S. manufactured goods, this is them in order. So Canada is our largest trading partner, and you continue going across the list here. Notice that half of them are expanding, so they're blue, and the other half are shrinking, and they're red. Um, so notable ones here, and I've already more or less foreshadowed it. Canada is our largest trading partner. That's all about energy, right? And we've seen our exports to Canada d down this year as a result. Uh, China continues to decelerate in a very meaningful way, uh, and uh, uh, look for that to continue. I think they're going to continue to slow uh, very, very rapidly, much faster, I think, than people were, were, were thinking that they were. Uh, my guess is that officially they're going to grow 6.5% next year. I say the word officially because I, I think people take Chinese numbers with a grain of salt. Uh, but, but you're going to continue to see that number fall, and, and, and I think that as China continues to evolve, that's really, I think, slowing down much of the rest of Asia and the emerging markets. So when you look at the emerging markets, and you think in particular just of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, only one of them right now is doing well, and that's India. The others are all contracting very, very rapidly. Uh, the one bright spot in here, and who would have thought I would ever said this about Europe, is, is Europe. Uh, Europe is, is, is growing at only 1.2%, but they're moving in the right direction, and they've really more or less brushed off Greece for now. Uh, um, Greece will come up, it always does, but they're mostly brushing it off, and you're seeing in general uh, Europe moving in the right direction. Europe is an important market for us. They're the second largest region after North America. We want a strong Europe, we want a strong Asia, uh, and this is a large part, this graph, uh, of why we continue to have so many struggles uh, in our exports. And so how's that for a quick trip around the world? Uh, I could go into more detail on every, any one of those countries, but I also want to make sure that John, uh, John Diamond has time. So with that, I'll turn it over to him, and then we can take some Q&A. Thank Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, generally about some fiscal policy challenges that the, the U.S. is facing. I'm basically going to uh, go through federal issues, some state and local issues, uh, and then some international issues, and, and, and look at the private sector just a little to cover all of the uh, avenues uh, that all the, all the ways that debt uh, could be draining or slowing our economic growth. Uh, and so the first chart, and, and a lot of my charts are just taken from CBO or various places, so we'll announce that and we'll just talk about what we can learn from it. Uh, so the first chart looks at uh, total deficits and surpluses over the next 10 years, so from 2015 to 2025. It's a well-known chart. Uh, deficits, as you can see in the light pink area right around the dotted line, are projected to get slightly better over the next few years uh, before then starting uh, to once again balloon up to above the 50-year uh, average of 2.7% of GDP. So by 2025, where CBO is, CBO's baseline uh, is, is predicting deficits of about uh, 4%. So is this a projection? Is CBO trying to guess what's going to happen in 2025? Or is this not a projection? That's always a question you should ask. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, and so we, the, the basic point is short term, we're, we're, we're not wildly different uh, than we've seen over the last uh, 50 years. We're right around the 2.7%, although at the end of that window we see the deficit starting to grow. Uh, if we look, take a more long-term perspective, things are a little more challenging. Uh, so long-term issues, what starts to happen? is we see the federal debt held by the public continuing to increase in the out years, uh, with the debt reaching 103% of GDP by 2040. And so, so that's a significant number, uh, and it would, it would definitely probably uh, include a slowing of economic growth in the U.S. if, if, we, if we see this. Uh, we can break this apart uh, and, and look at what's causing the debt. So if we look at is it spending, is it taxes, are we not raising enough revenue, are we spending too much? Uh, so if you just look at CBS projections for spending and revenues, you see that 
Uh, revenues are going up. Uh, they're currently about, uh, they're right around the average currently of 17.4% of GDP, and they're projected to increase uh, to 19.4% of GDP over the period from 2015 to 2040. Uh, and, and so it's not, and you, you could say that our, our revenues are pretty much around our average and increasing. So we're going to be collecting more in tax revenues in 2040 than we do today uh, and than we probably ever have on average. I think only a few years around the 2000s did we collect more than 19.4% in revenues. Uh, spending is also going up, and this is mainly related to an aging population uh, that receives uh, two major entitlements, Medicare and Social Security. And we see spending increasing from, uh, so its 50-year it's average is 20.1%. Uh, by 2025, spending will be about 22.2%, and by 2040, it'll be 25.3%. So a pretty large increase in spending in the out years. And that's gonna to lead to a budget deficit that's about six percentage points of GDP, which is, is far too large. So you would like your budget deficit. I mean, if, I would say if your budget deficit is smaller than your growth, so if the economy grows at 3%, your budget deficit's 2.5%, you're effectively shrinking the, the debt to GDP ratio. But if it's the other way around, then your debt to GDP ratio is going to explode. And that'll, that'll, that's where we get into this, this, uh, this idea that fiscal policy is unsustainable. The problem is, is we have to ask the question, uh, are these numbers overly optimistic? And, and the, the, the real answer is no. They're, uh, well, it's a tricky answer. So this gets to the point. Does CBO try to project what's going to happen in the future? Or are they simply providing a baseline to lawmakers so lawmakers have something to compare their decisions on? And CBO's uh, uh, purpose is to provide a baseline to lawmakers, not to project exactly what's going to happen in the economy. So the baseline numbers are, are all based on what's called uh, current law. So whatever the current statutes and the law say, that's what CBO includes in their baseline. That gives lawmakers a consistent uh, framework uh, to assess new policies. Uh, so another way you could do this is, is, is you could think about current policy. So what do we expect to be most likely to occur? And that would be more of a projection. So in some sense, uh, CBO doesn't even attempt to project what's going to happen. They're just projecting what current law says will happen. Uh, but we all know current law probably is not going to be, is not going to last. So there's, there's this, so, so one of the problems we have is that there are basically several big uncertainties that we have to account for to kind of think are these numbers we saw uh, realistic. And so the first one is there's future policy uncertainty. We don't know what future policymakers are going to do, and they have a lot of really tough decisions uh, that they have to make, and they have to make some of them relatively soon, uh, starting in October, uh, when they decide what to do with the sequester caps. So under CBO's alternative fiscal scenario, which is a fiscal scenario based off current policy, so it's CBO asks the question, what do we expect to happen? over the next 40 years? What policies do we expect Congress to continue to pass? We, of course, if they've passed the research and development tax credit uh, 10 times and every year they've had a two year extension of it, so they've done it for 20 years, then I think it's reasonable to say they're going to continue to pass it in future Congresses. And so if you take those kinds of policies, um, and if you read into proposals both by the president and the Congress, so one of the big factors is, is we have this sequester uh, where current spending is being capped because of the, the budget agreement. And, and once the parties fail to come to agreement, the sequesters took force. Uh, well, neither the president's budget nor any proposal in Congress currently actually says they want to stick to the sequester caps. In fact, all of the words that all that you hear out of Washington is the caps are too stringent and they want to move away from the caps. 
Uh, and so if they move away from the caps, that's going to change CBO's numbers because CBO's numbers are based on those caps being effective. Uh, and so future policy uncertainty is a big issue. If we look at, at the alternative scenario, GDP would be 175% of GDP in 2040 instead of 103%. I mean, that is a huge difference. And it's an important difference that would have a lot to say about growth in the United States moving forward. Uh, there are also several economic issues. Currently, uh, we have a prediction for interest rates, but interest rates are fairly low. If, if CBO was off by 75 basis points on their predicted interest rate, so if, if R was higher by 75 basis points, debt would be 130% of GDP, not 107%. And so that's, that's a pretty large, that's the largest uncertainty as far as the economic projections go. If productivity slowed by 0 0.5 percentage points relative to CBO's predictions, uh, debt would be 125% of GDP, not 107. Uh, and then also, CBO doesn't try to, uh, to evaluate the economic effects of the underlying policies that are occurring in the baseline. So we have more spending and higher taxes in the baseline. Those higher taxes would be related to economic distortions, which would lead to lower economic growth. If you include those types of, of, of economic effects into CBO's baseline, we, that would increase the deficit from 5.9% to 6.6%, so about 7 tenths of a percent. Uh, or almost 1% of GDP. So that's another significant uncertainty. So all of the uncertainties work in one direction, which is CBO's numbers are a best case scenario at best. And, and, and I, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that it's likely, we're likely to end up much closer to the 175% number than the 103% number. So deficits are still a major problem. Uh, and they're going to affect economic growth going forward, especially on the federal level. But states also run deficits, uh, although they're not always deficits on the books. They run them through uh, promises they make to public employees. And so here's a chart from the Census Bureau that looks at how healthy each state is in terms of funding its pension. And so if, if you're a light blue state and you've received a grade of A, like Texas, uh, then, then the Census Bureau would say that the state, state pension default is unlikely. If you're a dark blue state and you receive an F, like Illinois, uh, the census or, uh, would say that the state is, this is one of the states that's most likely to default. And so we can look and see that there are about 10 states that are dark blue, uh, and there are uh, five or six more that are almost dark blue. Uh, and so it, it's worth looking. What, so what, what is the, the total amount of debt, pension debt, that we have outstanding in the U.S.? <laughs> Uh, so Moody's finds that the total unfunded liability in the U.S. is currently about $3.8 trillion. Uh, so the, the debt, the U.S. debt's about $18 trillion. So total U.S. federal plus state debt uh, puts us at about $22 trillion. That's, that's larger than GDP already, so that's a, that's a tremendously large number. If we put that in terms of, so the $3.8 trillion, so there's an argument that goes on between actuaries and economists about how do you calculate the value of forward-looking debts? And, and to calculate that value, you have to discount future values back to the current time. And so most pension funds use discount rates equal to their expected rate of return on investments, which they usually assume they're going to get like seven and three quarters percent. Well, that shrinks the value of the promises that they've made to, to pension beneficiaries. Uh, Moody's and, and many economists, financial economists, have said that's the wrong way to do it. You should value, you should discount the pensions based on how likely it is that you're going to have to pay them, which means if you're certain to pay them, then you should have a very low discount rate. And so Moody's uh, takes somewhere in between. They, they actually assume a 4.3% discount rate to calculate their $3.8 trillion number. So 
if pension funds were invested in relatively safe assets so that we didn't face risk, to get to solvency, that 3.8 trillion number would mean that every American would have to pay $12,000 today. That's a, that's a large number. Um, so we can also look, so we look at the states, 37 of the 50 states have funded ratios less than 80%. 80% is kind of the baseline. If you're above 80%, we say that a pension is, is adequately funded. If it's below 80%, we say that it's inadequately funded. If you're at 47%, like Illinois, then you have huge problems. And those problems show up in cash flow because in order for Illinois to, to get back to a fully funded system, they have to make larger contributions each year, actuarially, so we call it the actuarially required contribution. Uh, and so Illinois' contributions are, are approximately 31.9% of their payroll. Normally you would think of a pension cost, you would want a pension cost for a business to be no larger than 15%. I mean, that's at the absolute top. So when you're talking 32%, that is a huge uh, payment just for pension benefits uh, to, to an employee. And I don't think many, I don't think any private sector company could survive uh, probably through a year with, with that type of employee expense. Uh, and we see Connecticut's at 49, Kentucky's at 50. Basically, we see a lot of bad news. Uh, and, but remember, Texas was light blue. So there we had good news. Texas's pension is, is, un, is, is, is solvent. And so things must be good in Texas, right? Wrong. So municipalities also <laughs> have pensions. Uh, and Houston is, a, is, is the poster child for a troubled pension. So Houston's pension, if we compare it, well, who do, they, who do they look like? Well, they look like Illinois, Connecticut, Kentucky, and Alaska. So Houston's unfunded accrued liabilities are a total of about $3.2 billion. This is only for the pension. I'm not, uh, with, there's another uh, $2.4 billion in, in retiree health benefits that they're also on the hook for. So that's a total of about... 5.6 billion. That also doesn't include about 600 billion in money that that has been borrowed and then put into the pension system to make the pension system look better off. But but we should include that. Um, and so what do we have in Houston? Well, we have uh, uh, the actuarially required contributions that the city needs to make are to each of the pensions, so there's a, fire, a fireman's pension, a police pension, and a municipal employee's pension, all are underfunded. The municipal employee's pension is by far the worst off. Uh, the, the required contributions are 33.2% of payroll, 27.5% of payroll, and 36% of payroll for the three pensions. So those are right there with Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky and Alaska and all the other states that, that are facing major problems. This is why Houston is having major struggles right now because the cash flow, those payments are very large. In fact, Houston can't pay. If you go to the, the, the city's CAFR, they didn't even contribute the actuarially required amount. They only contributed 239 uh, to the municipal, they only contribute 21.5 to the fire and 25.5 and to the police. So they're, they're not even capable of making their required contribution. And this year, we struggled to, to, to make the, the contributions we made. So Houston is, is in a world of problems, as are a lot of other municipalities. So we have problems at the state and the municipal level uh, that we need to think about. You know, the result of a pension problem is really pretty easy to solve. You're either going to raise taxes to pay the benefits or you're going to cut the benefits. Either, although you're probably going to end up cutting the benefits for future retirees, not current retirees. So there's an intergenerational uh, equity issue at work at play here as well. Well, so what about the private sector? So we've looked at the federal sector. We've looked at the state and local sector. Uh, there's actually a little bit of good news here. I mean. There's one troubling aspect in that businesses have taken advantage of cheap borrowing and they've borrowed over a trillion dollars in refis 
uh, from 2012 to 2014. And my concern is that as rates start going up, have they, have they taken on too much debt because interest rates were so low? And as rates go up, is that going to cause uh, some pain in the future? And I, th I think that is a, a legitimate concern. Uh, another private sector problem that we've heard a lot about is student loan debt. So it's currently $1.2 trillion in student loan debt outstanding. 11.5% of that $1.2 trillion is delinquent or default. It's delinquent for 90 days or already in default. And so immediately we think crisis. Well, this actually is maybe the one bright spot. I don't see the student loan debt problem as a crisis. It's a problem. It's a real problem for people that go to for-profit institutions or uh, non-profit institutions but don't get out. But, but all the research I'm showing and seeing or reading shows that kids, that the students that go to uh, not-for-profit institutions and get a graduate degree or, or a degree generally earn more money and they earn enough money that they can pay off uh, the average debt incurred by the student fairly easily. And that's usually around $32,000. So it's like the price of a car. But students that go to for-profit institutions are the ones that are having, A, they're having the hardest time getting a job when they get out, and B, they're coming out with larger debt. And they account for about 40 to 60% of the delinquency rate in, in these numbers. So the real problem is at the two-year institution level, and the for-profit level, I don't think this qualifies as a crisis. It's just simply a problem uh, that, that needs to be addressed. And lastly, we can get to this issue of secular stagnation or international issues. Uh, so is, the, is, is slow growth just the new normal? Are we in a new world where we just grow more slowly? And is that the result of just higher, of, of countries carrying higher deficits? Uh, Summers likes to, uh, Summers argues that we are. Uh, higher pensions, higher health costs are reducing investment and reducing productivity and we're going to have this 2% growth for a long time to come. We're not going to rebound up to the 3% to the growth that, that we've seen in, in, in the past. Uh, the OECD has a, has a new report out in July that is somewhat uh, consistent with that. They, they, they issued a warning of slower growth given that many developed nations have public sector debt greater than 80%. In fact, 34 OECD states average 111% debt to GDP ratios. So a lot of developed countries are, carry, are, are carrying far too much debt. Debt is, is, has to be paid. That reduces consumption. When you reduce consumption, manufacturers don't have to make as many goods. Economic growth slows down, and, and we all end up worse off. And really, it's just a trade-off. We've, we've consumed more now, which means we're going to consume less later, which means we made more now, which means we're going to make more later. Growth is going to slow down. Uh, and that's the issue that we face. So I will, I will end with that happy note on the, at least the one the slide before. I got one happy note in. Uh, so I will end there, and uh, we will take questions and look forward to learning from those, have a discussion on that. Well, thanks very much. That was uh, really informative, really interesting, <coughs> not so cheerful, but uh, we'll, ha we'll have to go with what we've got. Uh, we'd like to take uh, questions from the floor, but I'd like to uh, take the prerogative, I guess, of, since we have Chad here, I'd like to ask him uh, one question. I've seen you on CNN comment that one of the issues that is the, of, of most concern to manufacturing executives is, uh, is tax and, and regulation policy, general tax reform uh, in particular, and the, the recent proposal that was uh, offered by uh House Ways and Means Committee uh, Chair Dave Camp uh, took sort of the, the standard approach to tax reform. That is, uh, it was a base broadening, rate reducing reform, uh, including a lowering of the uh, corporate rate, but uh, financed by elimination of a lot of investment incentives. And so I'm wondering if you think that that is just in general terms the right approach to take to tax reform, or if you'd like to see an alternative approach taken. Okay. So first off, I, I can also give good news on the economy too. So if we can, we can actually show you some good stuff. Uh, and I, and I do, on the secular stagnation argument, I, I think that there are things that we can do to get better growth. And I, so I, I don't want to think that we're. St I, I'm not a believer in secular stagnation. Actually, I think that there are things which are holding us back. 
Uh, but if we have the right policies in place, we certainly can grow better than 2.5%. I think that's the challenge, of course, is policy related. And first and foremost of that, of course, is taxes and regulations. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, what we continue to say that you know, we have the highest marginal tax rates in the world. Uh, and, and you see that at the corporate level, you see that at the, at the individual level for pass-throughs. Uh, you know, keep in mind that for manufacturers, most of the household names that you think of are obviously C corporations and they're paying the highest taxes in the world. But most of our members are small and medium-sized members. And so this, this is what makes this issue uh, such a challenging one from a policy perspective and why we continue to talk about comprehensive tax reform. Uh, the challenge for it, is, uh, uh, the good news, I guess, I'll start with the good news. The good news is that you have both Republicans and Democrats talking about the need for tax reform. Uh, they primarily are talking about corporate tax reform uh, because the individual side is that much tougher to, uh, not to crack. Uh, uh, but you do at least have a recognition that we need to bring down marginal rates and broaden the base in some, in some way to make us more competitive globally. Uh, the challenge there, uh, and, and also to move us to a territorial tax system. The challenge there is that there's a difference, I think, between when you look at Republicans and Democrats and, and how they view tax reform. Uh, for, the, for the Democrats, usually when they're talking about tax reform, they're, they're talking about it as a way to raise additional revenue. Uh, the current conversation in Washington, for instance, is talking about tax revenue uh, that will pay for something, usually the Highway Trust Fund right now, a couple, a couple years ago it was for deficit reduction, but there's usually some additional revenue attached to tax reform that's going to be beneficial. You get a one-time payment of something that pays for something. Um, and that's why usually when you're looking at the administration's tax, uh, tax reform proposals, the marginal rates never really go below 28%. They usually are 28% or something along those lines. Um, Republicans, of course, don't see it that way at all. They, they would prefer revenue neutral uh, tax reform. And so you have to bridge that gap. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, the other big challenge that's out there, of, of course, is that you have, you have all those pass-throughs that are S-corporations and LLCs, and you have to find a way that if you're going to pay for corporate tax reform by getting rid of Section 179 or R&D expensing or any of those other things, you've now left all these pass-through entities kind of out there on a lurch. Uh, and so uh, I guess the answer to your question is, yes, we believe in tax reform. We think it's doable, hopefully. Uh, as when we get a new president, whoever that person is, he or she, in 2017, uh, we think that that's certainly something that we're laying the groundwork for. Um, there is going to be a push to have corporate tax reform this year. Uh, you've seen Paul Ryan pushing for that. Um, but I think it's more likely to happen uh, with the next president. Okay, I'll I'll chime in as All well. Right, go ahead, sure. I, I agree that the, the those are the there is good news and that if we could reduce the, the the level of our regulation and reform our tax system, uh, we we could achieve higher growth. So I agree completely with that. The problem is we actually have to do it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where I'm less optimistic. Uh, and then on to the cor on the corporate tax reform point, I, I I agree. I think a corporate reform and actually my prestigious colleague and I have written on this issue uh, is that if you broaden the base by getting rid of, rid of investment incentives and, and use that to lower the rate, I, I don't think that's going to be a growth enhancing policy. I think we need to keep the investment incentives uh, and use other base broadeners and, and find other ways to, to lower the rate. Okay, so questions from the floor. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> I have a question on the. Um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Chad, on, on your um, your chart with the sentiment from the NAM members, yeah. did that take into account the size of the company? Because I know you have quite a diverse membership, or was that just normalized by the quantity of companies? We do, and perhaps it's because I used to be at the SBA, the Small Business Administration. I almost always look at firm size, um, and and in this particular case, really over the last two quarters. Uh, the smaller the manufacturer, the more optimistic they were. And this is the flip of almost every quarter that this survey's been done. Usually the larger ones are more optimistic. Uh, but I think the challenge here is that, uh, that that export drag is significant. The dollar headwinds, the global headwinds. The larger you are, the more likely you're, you're exporting and you're exposed to the international markets. And so you do tend to see uh, the larger manufacturers a little less optimistic in terms of sales expectations 
Uh, what I didn't say in here is exports actually turned to negative in this survey, so the expectation over the next 12 months is that export growth will be negative. Uh, and so that's why larger members, at least in this case, were less optimistic about sales. Uh, converse that, just one positive part about it is that large members also are more likely to do capital investments. So they had hi higher numbers there, but in general, they were the least optimistic in this crowd than, than in past surveys. Yes. I think the question is to John. You mentioned how, but the, the key is how to put this plan in action, into action. And also, how to you, how could you keep the incentive, and yet, to balance. And with all things considered, Governor Perry was credited to bring a lot of business to the state of Texas, but he's not even in the running right now. So how? I mean, it, and then the other thing is on the local level, in which candidate so far? do you think will really listen to your suggest or like to, to see the point to really have a reform? Uh, so, so I'll take the local level because that's an easy one. I think, I mean, uh, I'm a friend and fan of Bill King and he and I have discussed this issue at great length and in fact, uh, he was one day he came up and visited me and, and he was the one that actually turned me on to this issue uh, maybe seven years ago. Uh, and so I, I know he has a full understanding of the issue. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but, but, but I would feel most comfortable uh, if, if he was in charge of it. I don't, just don't know the other candidates. I don't know if they would handle it well or not. Now, having said that, there's a real political issue here, and that is I'm not sure any mayor can handle this issue because the issue is really at the state level. Uh, the state legislature is going to have to act to solve this problem. I don't think a mayor can solve the problem. And, and I'll give Anise Parker, I think Anise Parker tried her best. I just don't think she has the political tools, meaning the political power, to do it. It's the problem, the, the roadblock is at the state legislature. Uh, how, do we, how do we enact tax reform? Well, I, th I thought the, uh, the camp reform was good. I think it could be improved upon. Um, I testified before the Senate uh, in February, and there were we had two Democratic and two Republican witnesses, and and it was we all agreed on what corporate reform should look like, and so I really don't know why we're not doing it because I think the the experts agree on what reform should look like, or they they're very close to agreement. So so a compromise should be possible. The problem is politically we seem unable to compromise. And, and that troubles me. And I'm also troubled by the, by the dichotomy that we face. We have one side that, that favors spending more money and one side that favors less taxes. You can't compromise off those two positions and solve the problem. Spending more money and cutting taxes only makes our problems worse. And so both sides need to kind of move the other direction. Uh, I don't know if they'll do that or not. I mean, on the positive side, as I said before, I think you do have, a, as John mentioned, there's a willingness on both sides of the aisle to do it. Um, the devil's in the details, and that's really where, where you're going to start seeing um, the fights, is, is that when you actually put pen to paper and you say, I'm going to cut this, tax reform or, or this tax expender that everyone loves, yeah. there's going to be a constituency that likes that. And so, uh, and that's true on both the, the business side and, uh, and on the individual side. So that's really where, where you're going to see the fights. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but from the big picture, both sides are talking about it. Uh, you know, Jeb Bush put out a tax proposal. I guess Donald Trump's putting out a tax proposal. So uh, the Democrats also have their tax, tax reform ideas. And so I do think that there is a willingness on both sides uh, to do it. So that's the positive, at least. Yes. I have two questions. One is, what do you think will happen October 1st with the government being uh, open, closed? I work for the federal government. Um, my second question, though, is with the optimism survey, you just made a comment that um, um, if you could talk more about the export side of it, because with the dollar um, increasing in, in value, um, what are companies thinking? You want to take the I'll take the first part. I, I see more political brinkmanship on the horizon. I, I, I don't know if we'll go into full shutdown again. I think we may have a day or two, but I know we'll probably go right up to the 
to the line. I think in the end they agree they abandon the sequester caps uh, and the budget deficit looks worse in the future because of it. Uh, I don't think that's the right answer. I mean, that's not the answer I would like to see, but uh, that, that may be. I mean, I, that seemed, just hearing, listening to, to, to them speak, no one seems uh, enthusiastic about maintaining the caps. So. And I mean, it is likely that there could be a shutdown. I don't think it'll be a long one. I think that Boehner and McConnell have clearly said that they don't want a shutdown, uh, but you, you do have uh, certain senators that want to grandstand and and there is likely that they're going to attach things that are going to, mm -hmm. you know, tie things up a little bit. So hopefully, I live in D.C. We won't have a, have a shutdown, uh, but but it's it's looking more likely than it did say a month or so ago. Um, on on the other issue, uh, this is a huge challenge. So you have 21 and a half percent increase uh, in the dollar, uh, and you know you've seen that number kind of bounce around a little bit depending on what people think Janet Yellen's going to do or or what you know the global health of the economy is at that particular moment. But either way you look at it, you're seeing a stronger dollar. And I don't see that, that underlying storyline changing moving into 2016. And, and the fundamentals are there for a strong dollar. I mean, if you look at Econ 101, why does, it, why does the dollar move? You're seeing a lot of investment flowing into the US, especially in the chemical sector. Uh, Houston's taking advantage of that, I know, uh, primarily because of, of cheaper natural gas. And so, uh, a lot of that is foreign money. The U.S. is still an attractive place to invest. You're going to continue to see that boost up the strength of the dollar. There are also, also some, some positive signs in the U.S. economy. We tend to be uh, relatively one of the brighter spots, even if we're not growing as fast as we like. Uh, but the bigger, the bigger factor there, of course, is monetary policy. We are clearly <laughs> raising rates. We stopped quantitative easing. Uh, we have four and a half trillion on the books to show for it in the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, and the rates are going to move higher, so they're going to increase, uh, you know, 25 basis points either today or in December, uh, probably a full percentage point again by the time we get to the end of next year. Uh, so clearly, we're in a, in, a, in a mode where the Fed is going to start raising rates. Converse that with the rest of the world. Europe is spending a trillion euros on, on quantitative easing between now and September of next year. Asia, uh, in both China and Japan, are doing quantitative easing, or, or devaluing the yuan in China's case. Uh, so clearly there is a stimulative move out there, and so while we are letting our foot off of the accelerator, the rest of the world is putting their foot down. That's going to make the dollar stronger. And so if you're a manufacturer, you're going to have to get used to dealing with a stronger dollar, and that's not an easy conversation to have. Um, and they're going to they're have to reevaluate costs, and they're going to have to reevaluate um, you know, how it is that you sell into Canada or Europe or any of these other places where they can now have a cost differential. The good side is that, and I'll say this part, a strong dollar is a reflection of a stronger U.S. economy. And so that, that is a positive, at least. And they also are seeing some benefits in that if you're import, importing inputs, uh, that obviously helps. Yes? Kind of as a follow-up, isn't uh, the fact that there's a negative correlation between the price of WTI crude and, uh, and the value of the dollar? then going to feed back into a negative feedback on manufacturing? So are, are we sort of entering sort of a potential vicious cycle here? And sort of a secondary to that, it seems to me that manufacturing, at least at the Houston, Texas level, um, accounts for a smaller fraction of, of employment. I'm wondering the extent to which you see the relationship between manufacturing and GDP. Well, it depends on how you define manufacturing. So we have a lot of members here who are in the refining business, and, and, and so there's, you could add to that figure that way. Uh, manufacturing accounts for 9% of GDP, so you know, roughly $2.1 trillion, uh, $2 trillion in value added last year. Uh, so it's, 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 not, you know, it's, it's, it's not perhaps what it once was as far as a percentage of overall, the overall economy, but it still is a, a pretty sizable chunk. Um, on, on the crude oil price, uh, you know, keep in mind, at the end of World War II, we were the only economy standing, and so uh, by, by virtue of that, all petroleum is priced in U.S. dollars. Uh, and so, uh, as when the dollar strengthens, uh, as we have seen it, ha as seen it happen, the price of crude oil has fallen, and, and vice versa. Um, so yes, it is kind of a little bit of a vicious cycle there. Uh, so that certainly, the dollar is, is playing into the price of crude oil. The other big factors, obviously, are supply and demand, and you're, and you're continuing to see supply not waning 
uh, much to people's surprise there, uh, even with 45 or whatever dollar, dollars per barrel of West Texas Intermediate, you still are seeing a lot of supply. You might see more supply if the Iranian agreement g goes through. Uh, and so that's going to put downward pressure on prices. Uh, but you're also seeing more demand. Uh, keep in mind, uh, you know, go out over the holidays and see how many extra people are driving as a result of cheaper gasoline. So there certainly are some, some uh, supply and demand functions there as well, which are, are moving that. There, one more. This is for Chad, um, and John, you can comment too if you'd like. Uh, it looks like uh, we're in for drawn out uh, political brinkmanship on XM bank reauthorization. Short term, what do you think that's going to do um, for our exports? Well, you know, the XM bank used to be non controversial um, for many, many years. Uh, I happen to sit next to the trade folks uh, at the NAM headquarters, and I see not only the TPA conversation, but XM every single day, and MTBs and all the other issues. Um, you know, it's really unfortunate that we've got to a place now where, where the XM Bank is being held up for really ideological reasons. Um, it's, a, it's a bank that actually returns money to the Treasury, so if you're a fiscal conservative, it's probably not the first place I would go after. Um, and, and as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, uh, it's put us at a disadvantage competitively. Uh, not just the headlines that we've seen with Boeing and with GE, uh, where you know, GE's moving some jobs overseas. Uh, but I think a lot of small and medium-sized members are ones that aren't, that aren't gonna make the Wall Street Journal, but you're seeing them lose out to contracts as a result of not having that export finance. Uh, and I think the, you know, the really frustrating part is that uh, you can have this ideological argument all you want about ex export finance and whether we should be doing it or not doing it as, far, as part of public policy. But the rest of the world isn't listening, and so we're unilaterally disarming ourselves. Every other country in the world has export finance, uh, and so it, unless you're going to get the Chinese and the Europeans and the Canadians and everyone else to suddenly not have export finance, why would we possibly think about disarming ourselves unilaterally? Uh, and so hopefully it will, it will um, pass. We think eventually it will pass. If it makes it to the House or Senate floors, it, it, we have the votes for it. Uh, the challenge is getting it to the floor, and I think that that, that has been the challenge, certainly in the House. Uh, I would look for it to be attached to a must-pass thing in the Senate, um, whatever that vehicle is, and, and hopefully we'll get it reauthorized. I, if you I love the issue as a, uh, as a topic in an in a <laughs> intro or intermediate level class, because the, I mean, the standard theory is you, you shouldn't subsidize. I mean, I mean investment you shouldn't subsidize to get that but but then when you you know Chad's argument is right I mean the rest of the world continues to subsidize and it's a multi-period game and so now you really have to step back from the standard theory and think about it more in a game theoretic fashion of do we want to give up market share uh, by following a theory or do we want to play the game and try to outcompete people and so I I really haven't, uh, you know, I haven't understood all that I've read on this issue in terms of, I've read several people saying, you know, we just, mainly Greg Mankey on his blog saying we just want to, you know, just because no one else does it, or, or just be, you know, he, he used the analogy, if everybody else jumps off the bridge, you, you doesn't mean you will, but I, I thought that was a completely uh, irrelevant analogy because you, jumping off a bridge is a one-time thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> But this is a multi-period game in which if you lose out early, you may not be able to get back into it. And so I think we need to be a little more careful about how we think about it. So I guess I tend to lean towards, I think, the XM Bank is, given what the rest of the world is doing, I think it's the right play. Yeah, uh, maybe you can also add something in regards to the global perspective and the federal perspective. Um, I'm coming from the manufacturing sector in the oil and gas industry. Um, which are the perspectives that you as a, an economist from the National Association of Manufacturers are having in regards to the change in the market? And, and how you perceive that as a possibility to affect the, the policies nationally? I think you know, when you go out there and you, and, you, and you listen to CNBC or any of these other entities about the lower crude oil prices, there is a conventional wisdom out there that it's a net positive on the economy. I mean, you hear that dispute all the time. Um, the reality is we haven't seen a lot of the net positives yet. Um, 
consumers aren't going out and spending any additional money. In fact, for the most part, what we've seen happen since crude oil prices have fallen is the savings rate has gone up. So essentially, uh, you know, you see isolated instances of occasionally where consumer spending might go up for food and restaurants and you know, the iPhone, I guess, is selling well, right, the new one. So, so you know, you do, definitely you're seeing some isolated instances there. But in general, people are pocketing the difference. Um, I was telling George earlier, this to me proves that Milton Friedman's permanent income hypothesis is accurate, right? People aren't seeing the change all that permanent, so they're not changing their spending yet. Um, so, so we aren't seeing those positives. And so what, instead, what we're seeing are the negative sides of that, which is the huge slowdown in energy investment and the huge spillover effects that you're seeing uh, in, in the manufacturing sector as a result. Uh, and so, uh, you know, from, from a policy perspective, uh, you know, we, we know that many of our members are really hurting right now. Uh, and we need to find ways as much as we can to try to make them more competitive. Uh, and this is true not just a, a, a for crude oil, but also of the dollar. Uh, we've just now made our companies that much more competitively or uncompetitive on the global scale, which again begs the issue of doing more on taxes and regulation and trade and all the other things that are our talking points to try to make us more competitive, given that we have those headwinds from, from, from the dollar and from crude oil. I, I think I agree with everything Chad said there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I like it. You know, the one caveat would be that, you know, if people are choosing to save more, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a wrong choice. I mean, if, if the, that's the budget set they face, and, and they want to save money to, to have future consumption. Uh, instead of current consumption, well, that's probably because that makes them better off. So uh, it's not, it, it's a negative now, but it could be a positive later. And, and so we need to always think about what, both what we, what we can see. It's this, the idea, the, the fallacy of the broken window. I mean, I could run across the street and throw a rock through a window, and that would give someone a job today. But that is a destruction of wealth. I mean, I've, I've broken a window. Someone has to pay to fix a window they wouldn't have had to pay to fix otherwise. And so, you know, we just don't see where that other money would go. So we, we need to, uh, I try to think long term about stuff. Uh, how do you see the generally weak development of salaries affecting the demand for products? I think that that, you know, certainly a lower productivity growth that you've seen. This has been a huge challenge. I know that Janet Yellen talks about this all, all the time. One of your points actually in your slide was productivity growth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that certainly is holding back not just job creation, but also uh, income growth. Um, in the survey that I, that I had up here earlier, uh, the average wage growth over the next year amongst our members was 1.5%. Uh, that's down from where it was, say, six months ago or nine months ago. It was closer to two. Um, I think, I, uh, so I think that certainly is going to hold back consumption, it's certainly going to hold back overall economic activity. Um, you know, moving forward, I would expect that those wage growth rates will increase. Um, almost universally amongst our members, uh, attracting and retaining quality workers is a big issue. Uh, and as more baby boomers retire, you know, there isn't a, a huge line of people waiting behind the wings with the trade skills that they need to be able to go into those jobs. And so. That skills gap issue is one that, that I think uh, is pretty universally felt amongst manufacturing companies, including here in Houston. Uh, and so I, I would expect some wage pressures you know, you know, moving forward uh, in general, uh, primarily because of those skills issues. That's an important issue in terms of, of income inequality as well. I mean, how are the gains in the economy being divided? Uh, one of my concerns is that uh, we're seeing too many above normal rents in the economy, so, so there's, there's too much market power uh, for a few firms. I would rather see that market power I'd have more competition between many firms with, with the creative destruction and, 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 and the widely spread wealth that goes along with that rather than a more concentrated power structure where wealth is also more concentrated. Uh, on the positive side, I think one of the reasons why so many politicians on both sides talk about manufacturing is it still is a pathway to the middle class. Um, you know, the average wage in manufacturing is a little over $25 an hour. Um, the average, you know, if you add it in salaries, the average manufacturing worker makes at least 77000 or 79000 I think, in the latest numbers. So it's still a pathway to the middle class, and I think that that's why manufacturing continues to get a focus in that income inequality conversation. Yeah. 
Actually, it's, uh, most of the inequality I see is not driven by manufacturing. It's financial services and stuff like that, where we have the the real market rent, rents going on because of uh, some market power. Yeah. I have one quick question uh, with respect to energy exports and specifically LNG exports. Would you, do you believe or do you think that it would be a valid argument to say that while you have, while the value of a US dollar has strengthened relative to other foreign currencies and that may decrease our ability to be competitive on a global scale with respect to manufacturing, that the LNG exports then would have an offsetting um, effect on our overall GDP and trade deficit and future global development? So we are a, a free trade organization and support the export of, of energy as well. Uh, and I do think it would have po ben positive benefits, I think, for the country uh, in both cases. So I think that that certainly is something that, uh, on, on, the, on the export of crude oil, certainly something that's being con seriously considered amongst policymakers right now on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and even of, the, of natural gas, I think you're, sl you know, you're slowly seeing those be winning approval uh, from, 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 the, from the administration. So I think it certainly is going to be a win-win for us uh, and hopefully will help the price element as well. I agree. I think, I think we have a huge comparative advantage in LNG and we need to take it. I mean, we should be supplying it to the rest of the world. Okay. All right. One more? Okay, last question. Was the scale gap and then student loan, and then some of the candidate proposal, uh, the proposed to have a, um, for the student loan forgiven, does that really help to close this, uh, the scale gap? Um, I don't know if I would marry those two issues together necessarily. I think you know the, the ways that you close the skills gap. Number one is you have manufacturers working very closely with their local officials and their educational institutions, like Rice, to make sure that that we're offering the skills. Uh, you know, the, the reality is, uh, you name a trade, people aren't going into those trades anymore. Or we don't edu we don't stress math and science and technology and innovation the way we should be. And so I think it really a large part of that is making sure that, that educational institutions offer those skills. So that's a large part of what we do at the NAM. The other part of it, I think, is a perception issue. People have, have their biases about what manufacturing is or what it isn't. Uh, and you have to convince young people that they should go into manufacturing. And you also have to convince their parents that, they should be go that their kids should be going into manufacturing. Because I think that there is a stigma there which we're trying to change. I think this is a problem that occurs earlier uh, the real failure is at the at the high school level. Uh, we're just we, we're failing too many students. We have a lot of great high schools that send kids to Rice, and they come in and they're brilliant, and they do a great job. But there are too many inner city kids that are just being left out, and and they're not they they we're just not providing an adequate education. Part of that, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think that's the that's where we, we need to attack that problem uh, to really have an impact on the on the skills gap for some of those lower skilled kids. Okay, well, I want to thank you uh, all for attending. Hope to see you at another uh, event soon, and please join me in, in thanking Chad and John for a great presentation.